Welcome everybody. Um, we're discussing today as Rabo Research the theme on Australia and the impact on Australia deriving from the crisis and the war we see in Ukraine from the sanctions put on Australia. And with that, let's get right into the details. Next slide, please. Ukraine is a major exporter of commodities in the world, especially for grains and oil seeds. And if you look on the left side, the map is showing you the major ports. Given war and the disruptions in the supply chain, all of those ports have been closed so far uh, a few days ago. As you can see, uh, that will also basically mean that very limited to no volumes can probably leave Ukraine as a country. Um, you also see on the map that a lot of Russian ports are clearly to the east of Ukraine. And we can also see that a lot of uh, your Romanian goods are leaving the country out of um, the port of Constanza. So with this, the whole Black Sea and, and the war there will probably also have an impact on the shipping out of that region. Markets have already reacted quite dramatically. Wheat since the beginning of the year has increased at Chicago by 30%. If you look at commodities like palm oil, we have increased by almost 70%, rising dramatically up this market, which was anyway very tight as we lose the supply of sunflower oil out of the region. But also the energy markets have increased substantially with Brent up 34% since the beginning of the year, reacting to the fact that not so much Ukraine, but Russia is a major supplier of crude oil as well as of natural gas to the world market. We go to the next slide. Ukraine itself, if you can look at the left side, is a major exporter. Uh, roughly 25 million tons of wheat would have been exported this season out of the country, almost 35 million tons of um, corn and also sizable volumes of canola, barley, sunflower oil. So the country makes up a market share of roughly 10% to 15% of wheat and corn globally with sunflower oil even accounting for almost 50% of the world's supply and trade of sunflower oil. So a severe disruption to the markets. However, if we look on the right side here at the chart, what you need to consider is that harvest time for wheat was already in July, means that the orange part on top that has already been shipped so far out of the country. So only roughly one quarter of the wheat is still sitting in Ukraine out of the previous harvest waiting for export. Roughly half of the corn is still sitting in the country waiting to be exported. And those volumes are still sizable. If you look at the dots here, the black ones, this is the crop or the export volumes we would have expected out of Australia this season. Given that the country has a record crop in this year, we would have just exported almost as much wheat as Ukraine would have. So the volumes the world market is missing out, those blue pieces are still significant and is a factor why we see those markets rising quite a bit uh, at global level, but also here locally prices go up. If you go to the next slide. So what have we done? We have looked at Ukraine and said, well, how can the country actually impact global markets? And in our scenario that no exports leave the Ukraine, we have said that both energy prices as well as wheat prices would move quite substantially higher in corn prices. This scenario has now clearly materialized. As said, Ukrainian exports for now are completely disrupted. The question here is how long these disruptions will last. Keep in mind, July is roughly the period when Ukraine will start its harvest for the winter grains like wheat and barley. Um, later on, September, October is the period when also the harvest starts for the spring crops. But we are already at the point where we're getting slowly out of winter in Ukraine. Um, as from April onwards, plantings of spring crops would commence. So the impact also on those spring crops is very much unknown. And we need to see, will the farmers plant? And what way do we have to expect out of the coming season, which will start, as said, in the second half of this year? If you go to the next slide, what we also then have to think about, if you go to the next slide, what we also have to think about and what has already partly materialized are sanctions on Russia and potentially also sanctions on Belarus, which has allowed Russian troops to be stationed there and to move from there into the Ukrainian areas to get close to the capital of, of Kiev uh, there. So if you take the whole region, um, 
you have to add in what you see on the left side, not only the volumes out of Ukraine, but you have to add on top also the Russian volumes that the world market is potentially partly missing out. And so combined, we're talking roughly 30% uh, of the world's wheat, 25% of the world's corn, 30% uh, or so of barley and canola, all coming out of this region. So we're talking massive volumes that the market is missing. And if you put in the sanctions, and clearly one of the major ones that we have seen here recently are the ones on SWIFT, which basically means it is getting very difficult for global importers to pay for any volumes that will be shipped out of the Ukraine. I'm not saying that it will completely, sorry, out of the out of Russia. So I'm not saying that any volumes out of Russia will not materialize anymore, but it is getting much more difficult. And that was the attempt of these sanctions to pay and move money towards Russia. Um, and with that, we have to consider that the trade is already looking for other origins to supply the world market, and that is fueling prices as we speak. But clearly our scenario B, which you see on the right side, this would consider no volume whatsoever moving out of Ukraine, out of Russia and out of Belarus. We are not there yet. But if you get to this point, I think this market will have an even bigger supply problem. As said, um, SWIFT is the, the key one. Um, and if you think about SWIFT, the big problem there is we do not know how much it stops really the exports. The best example we have, for example, is Iran. When Iran faced sanctions uh, from the SWIFT side, uh, the oil import exports out of Iran at that point in time in 2012 dropped by about 60% from the levels that they exported before those sanctions. So if we assume something like this for, for Ukraine, Russia and, and Belarus, this region, we probably still will see wheat coming to the market. I think it is highly unlikely that we're going to see direct sanctions on the export of wheat just for humanitarian reasons. This is a food staple. I very much doubt that we will see direct export restrictions on wheat. Energy might be one of the next steps. If the West End countries, US, Europe are running out of ideas how to further um, put more sanctions on Russia, maybe energy could come into the mix, but also keep in mind the region is extremely important for the European Union and the supplies of gas, for example. So with this, um, for now, I think that the highest sanction we have seen is the SWIFT sanction. As said, no volumes uh, out of this region is highly unlikely. Some trade in my mind will still happen. So the, the paper and the, the numbers we've put here on paper are probably extremely high. I do not believe right now in a doubling of wheat prices from the levels we had in early January. But as I said, we have already moved 30% higher and there is more upside risk coming if the trade out of Russia is disrupted. If the crops in the whole region, Ukraine and Russia are impacted, that will be harvested later this year. And if also the exports of those crops later in the year would also be disrupted. So the length of the conflict and, and any kind of potential resolution will play a crucial role here going forward. Dennis, if you want to move over into the wheat side. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, yeah, Kat, please. Oh, one slide back, please. Nope, two slides back. There we go. Thanks, Kat. Uh, so the, the, the main message here is that already high Chicago Board of Trade prices, which are a global bellwether for what's happening globally, have gone even higher. On the left hand side here, you see light blue Chicago Board of Trade soybeans. We look at that because it's relevant to the oilseed complex globally and canola. The orange is Chicago Board of Trade corn, relevant to the feed complex and of course then barley. And Chicago Board of Trade wheat is the blue color. We've seen a significant rise uh, even leading up to the Ukraine crisis, but now that the Ukraine crisis has happened, it's gone up even more. If you look at compared to the five year average, prices as of today are 88% above that uh, for wheat, 80% for corn, 66% above the five year average for soybeans. How did we get here? Well, leading into this year, so even before the Ukraine Russia crisis, we had production shortfalls around the world, we had increased demand from importing countries. And for example, if we look at China, that African swine fever that started to ease and they rebuilt their swine herd and the feed demand increased. We had government intervention, both from the import and export governments. And then we had speculative fund activity, which created a lot of volatility and pushed prices even higher uh, than the fundamentals uh, justify. Then we had Russia and Ukraine. Uh, this has, you can see on the, at the end of that chart on the right, how much prices have increased simply since last Monday. It's been astronomical. So this is a massive deal. How much of a big deal? Well, Kat, let's move to the next slide and I'll show you. 
what's the conflict's impact on GNO markets? That's what we want to know. Well, as Stefan said, Ukraine and Russia, just them, account for 28% of the world's wheat exports. If you add in Bulgaria, Romania, who also export from the Black Sea, that jumps up to even more. They are still exporting, but just something to keep in mind. 31% of the world's barley, 16% of the world's canola, and 60% of the world's sunflower oil exports. How does it impact Australia? Well, 48% of Ukraine's wheat exports head to Asia, and 32% compete directly with Australia. On the right-hand side, you can see Russia is blue, Ukraine is orange, and Australia is that golden color. A lot of, of those lines from Australia end up going to the same areas that, that or those orange lines go from Ukraine, so a lot into Southeast Asia. The Russian volumes, they primarily head to North Africa and Middle East, and if those trade flows slow significantly, there could be more demand for Australia to, for example, export to a place like Egypt. That hasn't happened yet, but they are looking for other origins. They're concerned what happens when supplies start drying up and we can't import from the Black Sea, if that scenario eventuates that they can't get anything from the Black Sea. Again, like that's they're still likely to get some from the Black Sea, just might be less. The next slide, please. What's been the global, what is the global wheat price impact? Well, the first question we've got to ask is, have we been here before? We, when the Black Sea has been closed off to supplies or to a large amount of supplies? Yes, we have. It was a long time ago. The Turkish Straits were blocked back in October of 1914. How much did prices increase? Well, around 45%. On the right-hand side, you could see the, the straight line that shows when the Turkish Straits were closed off, and then prices peaked at around February 1915. These are Chicago wholesale wheat prices. There's two differences between back then and now. The first one is that non-Black Sea wheat stocks, if we take, for example, Australia, uh, Argentina, Canada, America, and Europe, they're 30% below the five-year average, whereas previously, moving into 1914, they were actually 13% above the five-year average. So stocks outside of the Black Sea, they're low. And then Black Sea importance has increased over the years. If you look on the right-hand side on the bottom, Russia used to account for around 20% of global exports moving into 1914 when we saw that 45% increase in prices. Now, if you lump all, lump all those countries together, they account for over 30% of global exports. So arguably, it's, it, it, it is a more constrained and more severe situation uh, in the present. Then we got to say, okay, what, what's happened so far? Already prices have increased 26% since just last Monday. In the near term, there's going to be significant volatility to global prices, but you have to keep in mind that they have already risen substantially, and we're, we're assuming they already, they're already pricing in at least not getting the Ukrainian supplies that would typically come out of the Black Sea right now, so that's already priced in. But moving into July, when that key harvest window for the Black Sea opens up, if we, if we cannot get wheat out of Ukraine and Russia, that's when we could see some substantial upside, but we're going to go into the ifs and buts on the next slide. So what about local wheat prices? Well, this chart on the left hand side shows Quinana APW2 is a Western Australian basis. Basis is Australian price minus the US Chicago Board of Wheat Trade uh, price, and that has plummeted. So the, the, the discount of Australian wheat compared to overseas has gone to $137 per tonne Australian overnight. What are the reasons for that? Well, Australia has a massive harvest, one we haven't handled in, in our logistical system so far, and it's the, the logistics at ports and getting things to ports are just absolutely clogged up. We just can't get this much uh, grains and oil seeds out of the country, and hence it's having a negative impact on our prices compared to overseas levels. Now, what putting all this together, what are some scenarios of what might happen to prices? On the right-hand side, We've modeled the dark blue line, which is the most severe scenario of what could theoretically happen, uh, but it's not our base case. So this blue line that goes up to, yes, $600 per ton, it assumes basis stays at current levels of negative $137 per, dollars per ton. That's likely not to happen. It's likely to go more negative, at least in the near term, while all those shipping slots and ports are booked up. Point two, no exports from the Black Sea by July. That's also in most in, in the most likely case, that's not going to happen because, for example, Russia, even if their wheat is sanctioned, they could still export to places like Iran or China or Egypt. So all supplies are unlikely to be restrained from coming out of the Black Sea. You also have Romania and Bulgaria who could theoretically still export too. And lastly, North America drought. That could happen. The forecast at the moment is still dry and the maps show that it is a very dry situation. Now, everything under that blue line 
Uh, sorry, can't go back, please. Uh, everything under that blue line is the theoretical trading range. Uh, I know it's very broad. We thought the most important thing here is to show you what is the most severe scenario and then sh show you that the base case is likely somewhere in the middle there. And it, for example, uh, at, at the on the bottom, I've put what to watch on downside risk because we can actually go down in price if, for example, there are peace talks suddenly and Ukraine exports resume. That could result in a global a sharp decline globally, which will be felt here too. Trade increasing between Russia and China and continuing between Russia and food and secure countries. So maybe we won't get 100% of Russian exports out of the Black Sea, but maybe there's going to be 60%. It just means that those supplies aren't simply disappearing into thin air. And lastly, if the North America drought improves significantly, we could also see downside. And also if we have a large harvest here, uh, local prices will, will have even more pressure on them. Kat, please switch to the last slide. Uh, lastly, what about canola prices? Good question. At the start of the year, we were, we were seeing what was happening in Europe. Conditions were improving. Uh, conditions look to be on the up in Canada right now. It's a little bit dry, but it looked to be better than last year, and we were forecasting prices to track downwards towards $700 per ton. Given the current situation, we're, it's probably not going to go to, we don't expect it to go to those low levels now, but you have to keep in mind, though, that it significantly depends on what happens in Canada. Canada could easily offset what happens in Ukraine because exports out of Canada on a typical year are about five times bigger than Ukraine. So if conditions, seasonal conditions improve in Canada, it will outweigh, at least for canola, the negative impact of not having Ukraine. Of course, you've got to keep in mind about the sunflower, but it's just another factor to keep in mind with everything flying around that Canada could outweigh uh, the impact of Ukraine. And lastly, that's the last thing I'll say, uh, the peace talks and resumption of trade, if that happens, will have a negative uh, effect. Oh, and a very last thing before I wrap up, keep in mind, uh, keep in mind that July date. So if there are constraints, significant constraints on the Black Sea in terms of getting supplies out there by July, that's when the whole world relies on the Black Sea. It, regardless of what agricultural commodity we look at for grains and oil seeds, if they, if they can't get it out by that date, that is when there could be significant upside, regardless of, of which GNO product you look at. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dennis. So today I want to leave you with two key messages from the fertilizer side. One is that we see urea prices in particular doing a U-turn and, and increasing reasonably dramatically, particularly through March and, and April. But also we see supply risk increasing. So for, for growers at the moment who are procuring uh, their, their fertilizer, it's important that they take into account the increased prices and the increased supply risk we've seen as a result of this crisis. So for those of you who, who saw our outlook and, and read our outlook, I talked about three scenarios. I talked about a good news scenario on the urea front where we'd seen prices already falling about 40%. I also talked about a bad news scenario on, on the phosphate side where we've seen prices remain extremely tight, but I also talked about a potentially ugly scenario on, on the potash side and in particular also on the, on the urea side. We've also, now we've seen that, that ugly scenario, if you like, uh, triggered by the Ukraine-Russia crisis. So as you can see, I've outlined three ways here we see this Russia-Ukraine crisis impacting fertilizer markets. and. Again, I want to talk mainly about, about urea because that, that is the, the product that particularly uh, winter crop farmers across the country are now procuring, um, but also livestock farmers are, are looking to purchase, um, particularly for pasture applications over the winter uh, and, and spring as well. So really there's, there's three considerations here. The first is on the supply front. So a large a large part of the globe's fertilizer is exported out of Russia in particular. So we, we see around 21% of our myriad of potash, global myriad of potash exports um, come from Russia. 14% of the globe's uh, urea exports come from Russia, 23% of ammonia and 14.5% and, and of our MAP comes from um, it comes from Russia as well. So when you also add Belarus into the equation on the potash side, it actually increases to about 40%. So there's significant amount of global exports actually come from that region. Now, the second key impact is, is on port access. So, so in order to, to, even if you could buy a cargo at the moment, you actually need to get it out of the region. Now, 
we've seen heavy um, port restrictions around the Black Sea, and we've also seen shipping lines also uh, avoiding the, the Baltic in particular, just due to the fact that insurance premiums are so high. So, so that's our second concern, particularly around port access. Now, with natural gas prices as well, natural gas uh, is around 80 to 90% of the cost base uh, for urea. So, so we generally see urea um, follow the price of, of, of um, natural gas quite closely. So back in November, um, as you can see on this orange curve, when, when um, prices, were, natural gas prices were at their highest in, in, in Europe, we also saw urea prices, urea prices um, peak. So, so Russia supplies about a third of Europe's natural gas. So, so if we see some, some continue to see some restrictions around that, we've already seen the Nord Stream 2 pipeline essentially put on halt. Um, if we see further restrictions and further price increases in Europe on the natural gas front, that may also push prices up. So, so really a, three potential impacts on the fertilizer market side as a result of this crisis. So if we tick over to the next slide, let's bring it closer to home and, and, and really look at the key considerations here uh, for clients, because there's considerations both on, on, on the price risk side, but also the supply side. So, so really we expect prices will increase once again, as, as I've outlined, and, and we have seen global prices come back, uh, uh, sorry, global prices come back 40%. Local prices are yet to really flow through, but with a lack of a local transparent price list, you know, this is different from, from region to region. So under the current circumstances, we expect global prices will continue to increase, but we do think this is going to be lower than the peak that we saw in, in November. So, so some slightly, some some slightly good news there. Now, on on on, we, we could see that growth slower than expected if if we do see shipping from Russia, um, in particular in the Black Sea and the Baltic, actually increase. Uh, so return within you know the next month or even two months. At the moment, we've assumed that that. Um, we can effectively um, not in include uh, Russia in the global equation for about four to six months. So that's our base assumption at the moment. So if we see exports come back close um, sooner than that, that will help prices. Now, on the supply side as well, obviously there's been lots of concern am amongst Australian farmers about will they actually get their product? Now, the first point I want to make is despite all the issues around Omicron, Delta, COVID-19, so massive issues around supply chain and shipping, we've actually seen Australian fertiliser importers be incredibly resilient. So, so we saw um, last year over two and a half million tonnes of urea come, in, come into the country, which is pretty remarkable given, given the backdrop um, of, of the challenges that importers overcame. We're still seeing uh, procurement times very long, so three to four months in particular. So we could actually, it may take global prices three to four months to actually um, flow flow through to local prices. So, so that's that that's important to consider as a part of um, uh, farm supply considerations. But then also the fact that that Brazil are major customers of, of, of Russia in terms of fertilizer. So if Brazil is now looking to other markets to buy, you know, we have much lower purchasing power. So sellers may favor looking to, to sell to Brazil rather than to Australia, which may create more competition. And, and, and finally, our exposure is, 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 our direct exposure to this is, is relatively low. So we import around 5% of our urea annually from Russia. So it's still a small segment and, and there is capacity for our importers to, to look um, to other parts um, of, of the globe. But for growers that looking for that balance between do I wait for, for, for lower prices mid-year uh, that, that surrounding the uncertainty I would say is, is, is high risk and balancing that with, with the uh, you know with the concerns around supplies is an important consideration at the moment. So I'm going to leave that there and, and I think I'm going to pass the baton over to you Angus. Thanks, Wes. Um, very quickly, from a livestock point of view, direct impacts are, are at the moment expected to be relatively uh, small on an, from an animal protein point of view. Probably our largest area of impact is going to be seafood. Russia imports quite a lot of uh, cod and pollock, and uh, sorry, exports a lot of cod and pollock, and and imports salmon. Um, we may see some trade disruptions there and, and movements between Russia and China shuffle around a little bit. Um, but realistically, from the other 
protein point of view, Russia plays a fairly small part in the overall market. Um, on this case here, three to five percent of global beef imports for Russia. I think from a poultry point of view, it's it's that they have the biggest. Um, that's their biggest global exposure, and it's about five percent of global imports. So a relatively small player um, in terms of the direct impacts there. And you can see on the left hand side, we've got Russian beef imports have declined since 2014 when trade embargoes were put in place as a result of the uh, the Crimean War. So. Um, Directly less impact, but indirectly we possibly will see some, as we've mentioned through the course of this. You know, there are going to be potential flow-on effects through economic um, activity. You know, consumer confidence, interest rates, foreign exchange, feed prices, energy prices, all those things will start to have an impact and flow through to the supply chain. Plus, we've probably got to keep an eye on whether or not any sort of secondary sanctions are imposed, um, and whether that impacts some of our other trading partners. China and Brazil, et cetera. Um, but generally from an animal protein point of view, um, limited direct impacts at this stage. I'll take over there, Angus, thank you. And just um, some sim similar themes there to what Angus was saying around the direct impacts on dairy are, are quite insignificant at the moment. And that's certainly a different picture to what it was if you rewound 10 years ago. You know, Russia were the largest importer of dairy products when those embargoes were put in place. It clearly changed the scenario. You know, Russia have gone away and certainly built up their own internal capability around how much milk they produce and how much they actually deliver to the formal sector for processing into dairy products. So when you strip out trade between Belarus and Russia, you know, they import less than a billion litres of milk annually um, from the global market. So Russia and Ukraine are big plays in the global dairy arena. But certainly the, the way we're looking at it from a dairy perspective is, is through a number of different feedback loops. And, and the first one is really around the potential impact it has on the milk supply environment. And, and the, the chart on the left is good background to understand just how where we are right now in terms of global supply from major export regions around the world. It, it is our production chart that we track. It just shows you that on the back of weather related issues, labour challenges, supply chain challenges, margin erosion from already high feed costs, that we, we, we did see milk supply growth grind to a halt last year. And when we're looking at where things go to from, from here, we're certainly expecting some recovery later this year, but it is a, it's a modest recovery. And clearly one of the things that you know we've talked about is the elevated risk now around the cost of feed and what that does for farmer margins around the world. Some of that potentially has an impact on our client margins here in Australia, but when we're looking at it from a, a dairy feed ration perspective, you know, we're keeping a close eye on farmer margins in South America and the US um, because that's where high feed costs could potentially, you know, delay the supply recovery that we expect to flow through. So it's a it's an already tight global supply picture. It's part of the reason why we've got, you know, commodity prices which continue to go from strength to strength. Those of you that have got clients in dairy or that keep an eye on the on the GDT would have seen another big result last night. So right now you've got record high butter and cheese prices out of this part of the world. And now you've got milk powder prices for skim milk powder and whole milk powder nearing record levels. So it is a very, very tight global market with elevated risk around what feed costs do from here and how that, that impacts the supply picture. But the, a couple of the other feed feedback loops we'll be watching is around just the um, ingredient substitution. You know, when you get record high butter prices in a normal world, you potentially get more product substitution at the processing end where, you know, buyers and food companies in, in emerging markets that usually do use, you know, butter fat or vegetable oil, they might, you know, alternate their, their, their product mix to try and offset rising costs. But as you've heard already, you know, we've got a vegetable oil complex that's very high. Palm oil prices are particularly problematic for, for, for the consumptive pool of dairy products in Southeast Asia. So we're watching what that does, but it ultimately leads to, you know, a buffer for butter prices to be at very elevated levels because you can't easily substitute out to cheaper vegetable oil pricing prices products when you've got these sorts of pricing. Um, we're certainly going to keep a close eye on the product mix in, in Europe. You know, their, their seasonal peak is just around the corner. Uh, when you get high gas prices, that does have an impact on profitability from different product streams. So right now, cheese and whey would be 
largely the best performing product stream across the major dairy complexes. Uh, but with rising energy prices in Europe, that does potentially change the, the, the fundamentals and the economics around producing whole milk powder or skim milk powder because they are more energy intensive. So we're watching quite closely around how much milk is there through the spring peak in Europe, but where the product streams go to because it potentially has some impact on the pricing across the complex. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. But the other one, it comes back to what I was mentioning already, just around the potential demand destruction you might see in emerging markets. Markets. You know, a big part of the consumptive pool in, in Southeast Asia is taking dairy protein and vegetable fat and recombining it into dairy products like condensed milk and those sorts of things. Right now, those companies' margins are under significant pressure because of where dairy pricing has gone, but also where vegetable oil pricing has gone. So it does become a question of how do they manage that margin squeeze? Do they start to pass some of that through to the consumer and what's the volume impact? Or do they start to reduce some of their marketing and trade spend and how does that impact the market balance as well? To drive it all home and, and to look at the, the kind of impact of the market, I think as a summary, we have to say the volatility is to remain high in those markets. Um, it is a very sad situation clearly on the ground in Ukraine, but we have in these markets a, a, a very big uncertainty. There's a lot of risk priced already in. So I think the things we have to watch is clearly how effective are the sanctions on the SWIFT side against Russia? How much will that really lower the trade going forward? As mentioned, we doubt that it will halt the trade. I don't think that we will see no volumes whatsoever coming out. Russia will probably find a way to get paid for some of the trade that is coming out of the country. If we look at the price impact over here for our farmers, on the output side, as mentioned, grain, especially the wheat markets, have already done some work, but there might be more upside. Similarly, the veg oil market is driving quite a bit higher uh, because of the concerns that in any way tight market will lose out on a sizable chunk. Sun oil, as mentioned, makes up about 10% of the world's vegetable oil, so it is a, a sizable volume and with most coming out of Russia and Ukraine, this is a big concern to the market. But also on the energy side, on the input side for farmers, this is where we need to pay a close eye on Wes has discussed uh, what that means for the fertilizers, but clearly also for the energy you use on your uh, tractors with the diesel, we're going to see the impacts. Um, lots of the price risk is clearly in there. However, we also need to consider that there are issues that can still come. We see more upside if the situation drags on longer into the next planting season, if crops get impacted in the region, if exports would not only for a few weeks, but actually maybe for well into the second half of this year be impacted out of the region. So these are all the very much uncertainties that we face, but also on the downside, there is a lot of risk. As mentioned, um, in a market that is so volatile, we can also see a retreat from those high price levels. Um, let's hope for peace talks in the region, which could clearly already be a first sign for those markets to calm down. Um, but also we need to look at the global supply from other regions and how the trade flows will shape out now, um, bypassing some of the volumes that would usually come out of the Black Sea and, and how the supply out of Europe, out of North America and so on makes up for what we lose here. Nevertheless, volatility is here to stay in the couple of weeks ahead of you, so be prepared. We as research are here to help. Um, we've done a lot of work from macroeconomic work to explain what is happening in the region and, and how that impacts GDP to specialized reports on the grain side, um, but also our monthly, which will go out um, actually on the, the 3rd of March. Um, we're going to have a special in there um, to discuss Ukraine and the impacts. We will have podcasts. We have this video. So clearly um, we are here to help for our clients. If you need us, please talk to your uh, uh, banking representatives and try and, and schedule a call with one of us uh, to, to go through the details. We're happy to help if we can. With this, let's end the webinar session over here. I appreciate all of you uh, joining in and uh, wish you a good day.